The six-day war between Israel and neighboring Egypt, Syria and Jordan, ranged from June 5th until June 10th, 1967. The tensions between Israel and the Arab countries intensified from the mid-1960s due to incessant infiltrations and attacks by Palestinian terrorists from Syria, Jordan, the Gaza Strip, and the Sinai Peninsula. These actions were supported by the Arab countries, and tensions increased with Syrian shelling of Israeli towns all along the border, as well as Syria's attempts to divert the Jordan River, one of Israel's main water sources. The war broke out on June 5, 1967. Six days later, the IDF was victorious on the Egyptian and Jordanian fronts, as well as on the Syrian front, capturing the Golan Heights. The story of the battles fought by the 8th Brigade and the 129th Battalion on the Syrian front is not well known. How were the Golan Heights finally secured after 19 years of countless Syrian bombardments and attacks on the towns and communities of the Upper Galilee, Hula Valley, and Jordan Valley, which had resulted in hundreds of casualties? The elimination of the Syrian threat is by and large the story of the 129th Battalion, one of the most significant and important forces that captured the Golan Heights. The reserve forces of the Israeli army were drafted, including soldiers and officers of the 129th Armor Battalion, featuring American Sherman tanks from World War II that were later upgraded in Israel. The 129th Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Arya Dayan Biro, was part of the 8th Brigade under the command of Colonel Albert Mendler. The battalion was posted on the Egyptian front in the Mount Snifim area in southern Israel. Their mission was to block the Egyptian 6th Division, commanded by General El Shazli, from crossing into Israel and cutting off the city of Eilat. The brigade was under orders to contain them while concealing IDF missions in northern Sinai. It was hot and grueling under the camouflage nets. Training exercises, countless flies, and nerve-wracking anticipation of the impending war. On Monday morning, June 5, 1967, the order red sheet was given. The war had begun. The 129th Battalion fought in Kuntila, destroying enemy tanks and seizing Egyptian posts and territory. The battalion lost three men from Zulu Company, Erez Mizrahi Rimon, Moshe Mishka Gedosher, and Yaakov Yaakovian of blessed memory. On Wednesday, June 7th, half of the 8th Brigade was ordered to head northward immediately to the Galilee. The soldiers in trucks and buses, the tanks on carriers, the half-tracks on trains and tracks. A journey of 370 miles in 24 hours. The dusty desert heat was replaced by the Galilee's orchards and communities with Syrian shelling as a backdrop. On Friday, June 9th, the order was issued to seize the Golan Heights and remove the Syrian threat. The IDF Northern Command tasked the 8th Brigade with the main combat effort in the northeastern area of the Syrian border. Its mission, to breach and seize the fortified 2,600-foot-high mountain on the east, which gave the Syrians total dominance over Israeli territory. Based on Soviet doctrine, the Syrians established outposts and barriers along the three ranges, fortified by infantry, armor, artillery, and anti-tank weapons. The border crossing point was set in the northern Galilee at Givat Ha'em, near the Jordan River headwaters. This area had relatively moderate slopes that partially concealed movement from the Syrian outposts. It was decided that the 129th Battalion would lead the 8th Brigade. The orders were to seize the outposts of Zaura and take over the route between the Banyas village and the township of Masadeh. The battalion under Biro's command left Ayelet Tashachar and Kiryat Shmone for the border crossing point with the Zulu, Papa, and Victor companies. The battalion headquarters and reconnaissance platoon were sent to Nabiusha to serve as a communications relay station 
follow the battle, and act if needed. Picking the route of ascent was assigned to Major Rafi Mokadi, the brigade reconnaissance company commander, accompanied by Captain Danny Bonnet, a local operations officer who knew the area. 28 tanks moved towards the border at Givat Ha'em. Three broke down and remained behind. The ascent came under heavy Syrian artillery fire, which led to casualties and impeded movement. The tanks continued their climb, reached the Syrian outpost road, and then headed south. Leading the battalion, the reconnaissance half-track shuddered to a halt right before the Naamush outpost due to a technical malfunction. Tank company Zulu, Papa, and Victor, as well as the battalion commander's tank, overtook the reconnaissance team and passed by the Naamush outpost under heavy machine gun fire. First platoon commander Zevi Khitin's tank led the battalion. As the battle ranged on, the soldiers looked westward towards Israel, admiring the spectacular moving sight of the northern Galilee and the Hula Valley communities, who for many years had suffered from Syrian shelling and artillery, being at the forefront of the fight over the Jordan River water resources and the demilitarized zones. The road to Zaura on which the brigade was supposed to ascend was just beyond the Naamush outpost. The commanders of the lead tanks were not familiar with the area. They advanced southeast towards the sources of gunfire from the Sir Adib and Kala outposts some two and a half miles south of Zaura. The rough terrain and the ongoing battle made the battalion miss the planned route. When they arrived at the Sir Adib outpost, they mistook it for Zaura. A long trail of brigade forces, armor, armored infantry, and engineering forces made its way up the mountain. Artillery batteries deployed in the Hula Valley fired at the Syrian targets. Before reaching the Sir Adib outpost, three more tanks went out of commission temporarily due to malfunctions or the challenging maneuverability conditions of the mountainous basalt terrain. Syrian fire intensified, but the spearhead platoon continued to advance and improve positions. The leading tank was hit before the oil pipeline road and platoon commander Zevik Khitin was wounded. The 129th Battalion ascended further, crossed the oil pipeline road, and continued fighting in Sir Adib in the direction of the outpost of Kala. Battalion Commander Biro thought that the battalion was located outside of Zaura and requested artillery support fire, which was provided. However, the 129th Battalion was actually two and a half miles south of Zaura. After minutes of waiting for artillery fire, Biro realized that his battalion was fighting elsewhere. It was too late to return to the original plan while the battalion was engaged in heavy fighting against the outposts of Kala. Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Biro was injured twice in his face at Sierra D. Unable to speak, Biro wrote down his orders on a piece of paper to his communications officer, Company Commander Ilan Levanon, on the oil pipeline road ordering him to proceed while he was evacuated for medical treatment. West of the oil pipeline road, Major Rafi Mokadi, commander of the reconnaissance company, hopped on the battalion commander's tank and notified the brigade commander Mendler that he was assuming command over the battalion. The brigade commander approved and further instructed Mokadi to direct the battalion north to Zaura. Mokadi called upon the companies of the 129th Battalion to head north. However, the tanks had already passed the village of Sir Adib eastward and were engaged in fighting against the 8173 Kala and Tel Zatar outposts. Leaving Sir Adib, Mokadi headed north, expecting the battalion would follow. When he passed under outpost 8173, his tank was hit. Rafi Mokadi and Yuval Ben Artsi of blessed memory were both hit. Eight days would pass before they were located lifeless in a dry creek bed. 
The brigade commander, along with the 377th Battalion of Sherman Tanks, under command of Lieutenant Colonel Amnon Hinsky, and the 121st Armored Infantry Battalion, under command of Major Arya Karen, proceeded according to the original plan and headed towards Zaura. Two tanks from the 129th Battalion disengaged from the battalion before Sir Adib and joined the 8th Brigade headed to Zaura. A tank under the command of Yoshua ben Naim was hit inside the village. Yoshua ben Naim and Arya Goldberg of blessed memory were both killed. While the brigade made its way toward Zaura, the 129th Battalion was left to fight the Kala outpost on its own. As the battalion fought at the Kala compound, Nati Horowitz was ordered to assume command over the battalion. The order was relayed from the battalion headquarters in Nabiusha. Nati did not receive the brigade commander's message due to a radio malfunction. Platoon commander Ron Efrat jumped out of his tank, ran towards Nati, and told him, you are now the battalion commander. Chief Operations Officer Major Amnon Reshef, 8th Brigade's main headquarters commander at Kibbutz Amir, liaised between the 129th Battalion and the commander of the 8th Brigade, Albert Mendler. Ehud Abramson, the artillery support officer, directed the fire towards Kala Outpost using 155mm howitzer batteries located in Israeli territory. The Kala Outpost was protected by a huge concrete anti-tank barrier. The battle facing the barrier was led by Nati Horowitz as both battalion commander and commander of the Zulu Company, along with Papa Company under Effie Wallach and Victor Company, led by Ilan Levanon. The battalion came under fire from post 8173 in the north, Tel Zatar in the south, and Kala in the east. The Victor Company under Elon Levanon's command climbed up to outpost 8173 in order to neutralize the target and flank the tank barrier from the north. It did so with Yair Rombach, Tzvi Ronen, Ehud Kopliovich, and Chaim Arodi's tanks. The target was seized despite heavy fire from Kala. Three tanks from the Victor Company were hit by Syrian tank fire coming from the Kala area. Rombach's tank was first hit. Avigdor Greenspan and Zev Drury of blessed memory were killed there. Rombach and his crewmen Yaakov Choresh and Yossi Hassan were injured. Tzvi Ronen rushed to rescue Rombach despite knowing that his tank would be next. Moments later, it was hit and Tzvi was seriously wounded. Arodi's tank was also hit. The injured crewmen were bravely rescued by their comrades from other tanks who were hit as well. Yaakov ben Basat bravely rescued Choresh, who was badly burned. Stay strong, the wounded crewmen encouraged him. Kopliovich and Elon's fourth tank crews evacuated the wounded by foot, accompanied by crewmen from other tanks. 28 tanks entered the battle at 10 a.m. By 3 p.m., Less than half remained. Attempts to flank the concrete barrier were unsuccessful. The companies prepared to cross through the pass, which was in the center of a killing zone, under shelling and heavy gunfire from all sides. Anyone attempting to pass would be putting their lives in grave danger. The Victor Company, covered by companies Zulu and Papa, began crossing the bottleneck, its tanks moving forward among the huge concrete blocks. In the midst of regrouping, the force was engaged by heavy fire from outposts and tanks. Twelve tanks crossed the barrier under fire and continued a determined climb towards Kala. The leading tank of company commander Elon Levanon was hit. Four crewmen were killed. Gidon Weiss, Emmanuel Ronkin, Eli Wahaba, and Maurice Ifferdam of Blessed Man. Elon, who was wounded, was evacuated to the rear by Shaul Vardy's tank, which later advanced towards Kala. Platoon Commander Ehud Kopliovich announced that he was assuming command over the Victor Company, however, he was hit straight away and wounded. Three more tanks were hit between the concrete barrier and Kala. 
Platoon commander Ehud Gross, whose tank broke down, went up with his crew into Kopliovich's tank and continued to fight up to Kala. Platoon commander Zvika Harari, whose tank was hit, organized a spot to park damaged tanks as well as for evacuation and treatment of the wounded. The brigade sent a disturbing report. A Syrian tank company was making its way to Kala from Waset Junction. Company battalion commander Nati Horowitz demanded air support and pressured the tank commanders to make haste to the top of Kala before Syrian reinforcements arrived. Now the Papa Company under Effie's command took the lead in the battle for Kala. From behind, Company Zulu and Victor fired and covered on the move. The effort continued, constantly moving forward and upwards. Six tanks entered the village of Kala. The leading tank under the command of Alfred Pinkas proceeded slowly in first gear. Go, they shouted from behind. Step on it. But there was no one to give the driver a command. Alfred Pinkas, of blessed memory, was killed on the turret by a Syrian sniper, and the tank continued forward without its commander. A Syrian Su-100 tank destroyer hidden behind a house in Kala fired and hit Alfred, Effie, and Toib's tanks one after the other. A tank that was hit and exploded, a turret on the ground, a chilling testimony to a hard-fought battle. It is here that Benzion Solomon and David Levy of blessed memory were killed and other crew members and commanders were wounded. Vardy's tank withdrew from the scene but tried a different path but was also hit. Only two active tanks were in the village center under the command of Nati Horowitz and Nahum Ganzarski, with 17 soldiers from damaged tanks, some wounded. They took care of their comrades and cleared houses, trenches, and posts from Syrian soldiers, both tanks securing and hitting any threat that arose while keeping in contact with other tanks on the battlefield. Nearly two nerve-wracking hours passed until the brigade joined the battalion at Kala. All this time, they knew nothing about the Syrian force facing them other than a fear of the arrival of enemy reinforcements. IDF Northern Command Commander Major General David El Azar contacted Platoon Commander Nahum Ganzarski to ask for a status report and to provide encouragement. Shortly after that, two aircraft flew over, bombing the Syrian convoy. Syrian reinforcements stopped and withdrew, thus effectively deciding the battle. The two active tanks and crew members from the four that were hit maintained their hold on Kala. The northwest Golan Heights were under fire, smoke, and battle fog. It was here on the afternoon of June 9, 1967, that the key battles of the northern Syrian front took place. Tel Fakhir was captured by the Golani Brigade's 12th Battalion, the Golani Reconnaissance Company, and an armored company. Tel Azaziat was seized by Golani's 51st Battalion. The Zaura outposts were captured by the 377 and 121 battalions of the 8th Brigade. And here at Kala, in a final utmost effort, the 129th Battalion completed the seizure of the village while striking Syrian forces. Syrians withdrew, but not before blowing up their T-34 tank cannon. Uzi Avraham was one of the tank crewmen in this battle. We the crew members fought in the tank hull and turret, gunners, loaders, radio operators, drivers and hull gunners. We did not know the battle scene like the tank commanders exposed in the turret. War surrounded us. The heat in the tank, unbearable, and communication radios rattling with noise. The smell of grease and smoke, burning eyes, injured hands, reloading ammunition, kicking a fellow crewman to relay orders, inhaling the shell gases inside the tank. The tank in motion, jolting and shaking with each jiggle, you received a blow. I hear the sounds of explosions, bullets and shrapnel, we all cared, eager to fulfill our duty together and hope for the best. We were mission-driven and ready for anything. 
As twilight approached, the 8th Brigade had reached Kala from Zaura and joined the 129th Battalion. The tanks of the 377 Battalion that led the brigade's movement hit the last Syrian Su-100 tank that fired at them. The brigade commander questioned Battalion Company Commander Horowitz on the hood of the half-track in an attempt to understand what went wrong and what his men had endured. The men of the 129th Battalion fought fiercely, defeated a fortified formation, climbed to an altitude of about 2,600 feet, some six and a half miles, with rough terrain, reaching the mountain peak at last. The road to Kenetra, the capital of the Syrian Golan and Syrian army headquarters, had been breached. Damascus, the Syrian capital, was now under threat. The conquest of Kala, the highest and easternmost point on the first day of fighting on the Syrian heights, decided the battle for the Golan. The Syrian army began their retreat towards Damascus. A blessed mistake. That was how the commander of the IDF Northern Command defined the battalion's deviation from the route and the unplanned battle against the Kala anti-tank line of defense. Splitting the brigade and the double-headed ascent while neutralizing the Wasit area and threatening the Kala deployment made the task of capturing Zaura easier and expanded the IDF's hold in the northern Golan Heights at the end of the first day of fighting. Friday evening, the communities throughout the Hula Valley and the northern Galilee turned on their lights, an exciting sight for the battalion's fighters. First night in Kala, the battalion picked up the pieces and regrouped. The armored infantry company from the 121st Battalion under Uzi Shacham's command secured the battalion parking camp and assisted in caring for the wounded and evacuating the fallen. The medical staff did wonders treating and evacuating the wounded to the hospitals. The armaments and logistics teams worked all night to refurbish 14 tanks and together with the crews put the battalion back on its feet and on track. Saturday morning, time to press our advantage. The 8th Brigade and other forces advanced and captured Cunetra and later set the new border lines east of Cunetra. The Syrian army was no longer on the Golan Heights. The threat had been removed. Capturing the Syrian Golan Heights was achieved in 28 hours. The battle took a heavy toll on the 129th Battalion, 13 dead and 30 injured. 13 tanks were hit by Syrian fire. Seven were temporarily out of order, yet remained on the battlefield. The 129th Battalion carried on the main fighting effort, winning and deciding the battle over the northern Golan. This battle was a significant milestone in the struggle for the existence of the independent state of Israel and will always be an important part of the battle heritage of the 129th Battalion, the IDF, and the State of Israel for future generations. Citations were humbly awarded, two medals of valor and three medals of distinguished service. In Sinai, the other half of the 8th Brigade under the command of the Deputy Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mordechai ben Porat, including half of the 129th Battalion under the command of the two Deputy Battalion Commanders, Moshe Bankover and Shlomo Schechter, remained with the two tank companies under the command of Arik Peretz and Shilo Sasson and an armored infantry company under the command of Dani Meiri, as well as the 89th Armored Infantry Battalion under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Ami Radian and half of the reconnaissance company. After capturing Kuntila, the battalion headed west with the brigade forces that took Tamad. In the Nachel area, the brigade took part in the battle to destroy Egyptian General El Shazli's 6th Division, together with IDF Major General Ariel Sharon's 38th Division. The battalion reached the end of the war with half stationed in Sinai and the other half in the Golan Heights. The legacy of the 129th Battalion during the Six-Day War is mixed with pain and sadness. More wars were to come. In 1973, during the Yom Kippur War, 
They fought at Gidi, pass in Sinai against the Egyptian Third Army. The battles were commanded by Battalion Commander Ilan Levanon, Brigade Commander Arye Dayan Biro, who was injured as well as the commander of the 252nd Division, Major General Albert Mendler, of blessed memory, who was killed in the battalion's theater. Shmuel Korkis and Ilan Avni of blessed memory fell in battle as well. The years have passed, but the battle on the Golan Heights has not been forgotten by the men of the 129th Battalion. It is stamped on the souls of every one of them to this very day. Together with the joy of victory, the battalion soldiers were also left with the pain of fallen comrades. These warriors will forever remember their friends who did not return home with them. Yes, the Tahir, the Tia, 